Africa uh, is Junior Suna from University of Geneva. And he will talk about quantum chaos in quantum gravity. Please start. Yeah. Okay, so hello, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Um, well, let me know if there is a problem and I'll try to address it. Um, but so far, it looks like it's going okay. Um, so my title is, is quite general. And in fact, um, it contains some material that I believe a few of you have already seen. But my goal is today actually to talk about very recent work. Um, first of all, um, recent work together with the Amsterdam group. Um, that's Eric Velinde and, and collaborators. And then if time permits, and I hope it will, unpublished work uh, with Daniel Jeffress and collaborators. Um, and uh, well, I will, I will get there when I get there, but both of these are extremely important um, in the relationship. Well, I mean, what is important for both of these is the relationship between indeed quantum chaos and quantum gravity. And that's why I wanted to go through some material, which I said um, carries the risk that some of you have even seen it uh, from me, perhaps even last year, but just so we're all on the same page. So um, the overall motivation is indeed the study of black holes and the um, idea to address the puzzles between uh, the evolution of semi-classical gravity and simple constraints that Uh, uh, well-known examples that, that uh, encapsulate this tension are the famous black hole information problem due to Hawking, um, and that uh, is epitomized in, some, in what people call the page curve, but also the long-time behavior of simply of observables such as two-point functions in the presence of black holes. So, um, we will look at how such uh, simple observables should behave in a unitary system, and we will comment on how they actually behave in gravitational systems, and we'll find that they are not, are not compatible, at least, uh, if we look at it at first sight, in some sense, naively in semi-classical quantum gravity. The reason of those kind of paradoxes is indeed that um, we have a strong um, bias and good reasons to think about the black hole itself as a thermodynamic uh, entity. So it defines thermodynamic potentials and it has associated to it a thermodynamic entropy, it has associated to it a temperature and perhaps other thermodynamic macroscopic variables depending on which specific black hole we look at. And those ideas go back to Bekenstein and Hawking in the 60s and 70s. Now, um, since however, these th thermodynamic potentials don't just arise out of nowhere. Um, in fact, uh, in, 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 in practice, they, they have to be approached via some dynamics, and in particular, the dynamics of thermalization. So that means, of course, that we start with some excited state, some state that is not itself in equilibrium, and we, we follow its evolution, if necessary, for a very long time. And we find that at the end of this evolution, or we should find that at the end of this evolution, the system is described, or at least approximately described, by one of these thermodynamic uh, equilibrium states. And what is very nice is with this advent of uh, holographic dualities, which now have existed for a good number of years, um, one can actually study this both uh, from a sort of statistical physics point of view in unitary quantum systems, which will be the boundary perspective, and in the bulk, which will be described by a gravitational perspective and which should um, allow us to address precisely where, where one or the other pictures breaks down. And so the idea is to study a thermalization in ADS-CFT, both from the boundary and the bulk perspective, and to use what we know and what we can find out about thermal thermalization dynamics and holographic theories um, to address one or both of these puzzles up here. And what it turns out to be a uh, key from a physical point of view is the physics of quantum chaos and quantum ergodicity. Okay. Is the connection still okay, by the way, because my computer had some warning about uh, the connection.
Yeah. Okay, very good. So um, quite, quite generally, um, we, we're going to talk about quantum thermalization. Um, and quantum thermalization is what is on the lower part of this slide. However, let me just start by reviewing for one second what it does in what thermalization means in classical mechanics. In classical mechanics, in thermalization, we look at the dynamics of our system uh, as a distribution function on phase space. Um, and um, the idea is that in a, a system that is chaotic, that would be one which actually thermalizes. So for example, chaotic in the Lyapunov sense that initial states that are nearby on phase space um, very rapidly diverge and end up in very different parts of phase space under dynamics, together with mixing and ergodicity. So the idea being that the uh, phase space distribution uh, uh, that, that is approached due to this chaotic dynamics is one that is evenly distributed over energy shells in phase space. Um, this uh, uh, basically describes the way that a classical system approaches thermodynamic equilibrium. And indeed, chaos plays an, an all important role here. Um, however, uh, in quantum mechanics, this idea of chaos, at least, cannot really be uh, uh, the way that we talk about uh, the thermalization. Because in quantum mechanics, for example, quantum mechanics is not naturally well-defined on phase space. It certainly doesn't have notions of trajectories. And uh, so there should be some other way of talking about it. And so I just want to preview already both of these ways. So the so-called eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, ETH, and random matrix theory, which are in some sense quantum mechanical encapsulations of chaos, they will play a role in what I have to say. Um, so let me, let me say what happens then. What we say is that um, a quantum mechanical system well, um, we need to we need to find, in some sense, different signatures of thermalization um, in a quantum mechanical system. And I have made actually uh, one maybe slightly hybrid notion here. So I, I've, I'm giving you time scales. When I start my system in a non-equilibrium state, the first time scale that we'll encounter is the so-called scrambling time. This is actually one which sort of via semi-classical uh, dynamics does relate to classical notions of chaos. So in some quantum systems, notably ones that have a good semi-classical expansion, there is some echo of, of this classical um, um, chaos as well. But the other thermalization scales or chaos scales that I'm showing here, the Taulis time and the Heisenberg time, they are intrinsically quantum mechanical and they are intrinsically quantum mechanical signatures of um, um, how and when thermalization happens. So I will not describe them right now. I'll describe them on the next slide. Here, my goal was to show you sort of the hierarchy of these scales. And typically, we think of the scrambling time as being first. Then um, the system evolves further. It encounters the tallest time, um, at which point the system has, in some sense, become quantum ergodic. I will specify that sense. And then later, um, there is something called the Heisenberg time, which is basically the time that is, is dual to the minimum energy that it makes sense in a quantum system to consider because it's the, the typical distance between two individual eigenlevels. And so by the Heisenberg uncertainty relation, this gives you a, a time scale, which is just the inverse of the energy scale. And because it's related to the Heisenberg uncertainty relation, people call this the Heisenberg time. This is typically a very late time. It's an exponential in the power of the entropy while the scrambling time is a logarithm in the entropy. The Taulis time, I haven't specified some dependence on the entropy because I don't know it. And I think generally we don't know it. There is no universal dependence on the entropy so far to specify this Taulis time. So what I've given you here is the Taulis time for a very interesting holographic system, namely the SYK model, where we calculated it to have this dependence on the number of fermions N. But as I said, typically the hierarchy will be that first you have this sort of semi-classical chaotic imprint scrambling, then you have the Taulis time, and much later you have the Heisenberg time. And if you're willing to wait even longer, you might see, see things like Poincaré times and so on, but they, have, they play no role in what I have to say today. So um, 
some physical manifestations. And that's, of course, where it becomes more interesting. So the scrambling, even though, again, it is not really relevant for my talk, but just to, to give you the notion, this is related to this so-called butterfly effect. And this has been shown by these authors here and many others to be related to the physics of gravitational shock waves. And so people call this sometimes a quantum butterfly effect, but it is very similar to the classical, so it's sort of semi-classical physics. The Taulis energy, that is the first quantum chaos time. This has been um, shown to be related to the, uh, to the contributions of non-trivial topology in the bulk gravity. And in particular, the Taulis time, at the Taulis time, for the first time, these two boundary wormholes will become important. The time scale that I want to talk about most in the first part of my talk is this Heisenberg time scale, which is a very late time scale. And that is because um, recently, together with these collaborators, so let me name them once, Alex Altland, um, Boris Post, Jeremy van der Hayden, and Eric Belinde, um, we showed how to get a gravity um, calculation of the physics at the Heisenberg time. And the reason why this is interesting and uh, an interesting challenge is that um, not only do you need to consider this non-trivial type topology, these wormholes, in fact, you need in some sense to go to um, infinitely complicated topology in the sense that if this um, is the first deviation from trivial genus, genus zero, here you need to go in some sense to a genus infinity. And the reason is that the contribution um, is uh, con controlled by the parameter e to the sum phase times e to the entropy. So when this is non-perturbative physics, then this is what we call doubly non-perturbative physics. And my uh, goal is to describe to you, to some extent, how we understand this from the bulk. So we understand it perfectly, I want to say, I think at least in the context of, of JT gravity. But of course, um, I'm not going to go into all of the details for like of time. So um, what am I saying here? Sorry, I have my own panel in the way. Okay. So um, as I said, I'm going to talk mostly about um, the uh, genus infinity um, Heisenberg time physics. And um, I will only um, give you the details of, of, of what happens at the Taulis time um, where it is necessary to define quantities here. And then later on, I think that probably I will talk mostly about ETH perspective. This is the work that is uh, um, to appear this month with the Harvard group. So, um, okay. So the notion of chaos that we're talking about here for both of these timescales, the Heisenberg time and the Talis time scale is one that is related to the spectrum of a quantum system. And the idea is that a quantum chaotic system um, has a very specific, uh, um, let's say statistical distribution of energy eigenlevels. And if you look at one of the simplest measures, namely the probability to have two energy eigenlevels of a quantum system that are separated by a certain energy distance. This energy distance here is parameterized by S, where S is simply the energy difference uh, in, in units of the average distance between the levels, this delta. Then I find that even an individual given quantum system, um, for example, JT gravity, um, actually follows approximately the curve that is here in purple and labeled as the Wigner um, Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. And the point is that there is a great deal of universality that emerges because of quantum chaotic dynamics in quantum cha chaotic systems. And one great way to uh, characterize this, this universality is by saying that the energy level statistics, here, for example, we look at the two level distribution function is well described by the energy level statistics that one calculates by assuming that the Hamiltonian itself is a random matrix sampled from, from an ensemble of random matrices. And here it is the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. Um, we will hopefully have the time to, to address the fact that we have Gaussian here. 
the fact that we have orthogonal here and how you might actually improve on that in some sense. But in general, the general statement is that the level of spacing distribution on the scale of just a few energy differences really is well defined, uh, is well approximated by this Wigner GOE. So you see the thing that I'm illustrating here is that an individual chaotic system, I've just illustrated this with the Sinai billiards, that's a generic chaotic system that people like to study. We might as well, we could, we could also have looked at JT gravity. This has some discrete set of eigen energy eigenvalues. And if I plot their distribution, then it is well described. You see, it follows in some sense this Wigner GOE curve. But the way that we usually see this is not by plotting this, this Wigner curve. What we see is we study this famous spectral form factor, which I will uh, define on the next slide. But the point is that you study it and at early times, it will not look yet like the purple prediction from random matrix theory, but at late times, in particular, after the Taulas time, it will start being very well approximated by this, um, um, by, by the um, distribution from a random matrix uh, system. And in particular, it will have this ramp plateau structure at late times. So there is a relation between these two. Roughly speaking, this is the Fourier transform in time of this in energy. So um, the point is that the uh, energy scales at which this is actually apparent are of order e to the minus s. And to see the physics here, you do in fact have to have doubly non-perturbative control on the spectrum of your system. So um, the spectral form factor, one way of seeing it and why this is um, so interesting for black hole physics in general is that I like to call it the quantum microscope. Because um, one way of, of writing it is as a double sum over the Hilbert space. So I and J are two energy, uh, they label two energy eigenvalues. And I'm summing both. And if I look at late times, then I find that the factor that multiplies the time that I'm sorry, Jim, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, Maybe we should all shut the arm. <laughs> shut down the other one. Uh, excuse me, Julian, can you hear me? No? Why don't you ask someone else from the room? Fix that. Whether. Uh, Victor? So, Victor, can you? Okay. Yeah, he is out, but the, are we trying to check whether the Victor or others are out? I just got. I just got. 
Yes, I just got thrown off the network. But you know, let me do one thing just so that this doesn't repeat itself, I hope. Um, so could you share your slide again? Yes, yes. Um, okay, fine. So if this happens again, I can also use my mobile Wi-Fi. I, I just I just prepared it as well. Um, so um, okay. And where did where did you lose me? From this slide. Okay. So I will I will just um, I will just go on with this slide. I, I apologize. So. Um, so I was saying that uh, the factor that multiplies here the time is actually the difference in energy levels. So the difference between energy levels. And so the longer we look at this for the later Lorentzian times, the smaller the energy difference that we probe. And so this, this and other chaotic probes of a similar type are extremely good microscopes to look at the spectrum at very small distances, spectral distances. And so I like to call this the quantum microscope because it probes differences of energy levels at finer and finer res resolution. And so, as we said, in tip typically the level spacing, so what is... Excuse me, Julian. Can you hear me? You have a question? Uh, so now internet connection is not good. So then let me try to use my um, mobile hotspot. So I will join in a second. I'll just join the the network through this mobile hotspot. I just need a minute to, it's activated, but um, my computer is not seeing it yet. Come on, it's not a good time. I'm sorry. Okay, it's not finding it. I'll I'll go on, and while I'm 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 talking, it will surely set itself up. So um, so the so then the idea the the key idea here is that we use this um, quantum chaotic microscope to correct characterize in fact the microstates of the black hole at this extremely fine resolution, and that's nice because it is really this fine resolution, which is necessary to resolve these puzzles. Um, that I mentioned before. So, all right. So can we find a gravitational description of this? The answer is yes. And it was um, in the first place, it was uh, supplied by the Stanford group. So Saad Schenker and Stanford. And they did this at first in the two dimensional theory of gravity which is known as JT gravity. And it is in some sense a two-dimensional version, a convenient two-dimensional version of Einstein gravity. I've written the action here. So you see that it is like Einstein gravity with an additional scalar field, the dilaton. And it has a coupling constant, which is the Euler number of the manifold that you're computing it on. And because of this, it has a topological expansion which goes back to work also by Mezahani and Ena Orantin, these mathematicians. So um, the topological expansion means that when you calculate, for example, the partition function of this model at inverse temperature beta, you first have a contribution, which is the trivial topology, which happens to be a disk here. And then you have a, a second contribution, which is um, exponentially suppressed in this coupling constant, and it's a disk with a handle, etc. But more profoundly, you also have this topological expansion for um, 
what seems to be the product of two partition functions, namely all geometries that have two boundaries of inverse temperature beta one and beta two. I start with a factorized contribution, which is the product of two of these disks, but then I get a contribution at order e to the minus the scoupling parameter, which is actually connected and, um, and uh, links these two boundaries. And this is why we call it the two boundary wormhole. Now, the, uh, the significance of the two boundary wormhole is that if we look only at the contribution of the two boundary wormhole and we Fourier transform it um, in time, this will give us the linear ramp. And the fact that it's the linear ramp, so the rise that I showed you in time is characterized by the fact that it has a quadratic singularity in energy differences. So one over E1 minus E2 squared here. So this is equivalent to the linear ramp. But what is um, strange about it is that it seems to have given us a connected contribution to a quantity that ought to be completely disconnected namely the product of two partition functions. So gravity contains these wormhole solutions, which strongly suggest an average over an ensemble of quantum systems, because that is the natural context in which you find these uh, connected contributions. And we can have two attitudes to this. We can say, well, that's how gravity works. Gravity really is fundamentally an ensemble. And so the bulk theory should be actually dual to an ensemble of boundary theories. Or we can take the perspective, which I think is more natural from the quantum chaotic perspective that I'm um, advertising here, namely that this is merely the uh, signature of the universal level re repulsion of any quantum chaotic system. Um, and that the ensemble is in that sense emergent. So gravity is able to capture these contributions that tell you about the level spacing distribution. But if you were to calculate the full quantity it would end up factorizing because there are other contributions um, in addition to these particular wormhole contributions, which uh, make the overall quantity factorized. Now, um, right, so let me try now to connect one more time to this, uh, to the portable internet here. Sorry, so I'm gonna have to, um, how, how is the connection right now? Is it still bad? No, it isn't good. Okay, well then, I'll, then we'll just go on for the time being, so long as it goes on. So, um, so one way of understanding this um, is via this chaotic effective field theory of Wegener and Yefetov, which together with Alex Altland, um, I have brought to the many body realm with, where it can be applied to holographic quantum field theories. And the idea is to um, uh, encapsulate these universal contributions in a way that is universal in the technical quantum field theory sense, namely a consequence of symmetry breaking. And that can be done by looking at generating functionals of spectral correlations, which happen to be ratios of determinants. So just to explain that a little bit, if I were to take a Z1 or a Z2 derivative of a quantity like this, if I take the, so Z1 and Z2 should be energies like two energy, uh, individual energies. So if I take the uh, Z1 derivative of this determinant, I actually get the trace of one over the operator that's on the inside. And trace of one over Z minus the Hamiltonian is precisely, its imaginary part is the spectral density. So it's a sum over delta, D, delta functions at each energy eigen level. And since I have several of these, I can, I can generate from this several insertions of the energy density in this way. The fact that I have these determinants also in the denominator is simply a normalization issue. So I can get normalized correlation functions of the spectral density. So these ratios of determinants are generating gadgets for correlations of spectral density rho. So rho times rho or rho times rho times rho, et cetera. But, um, keeping it in this determinant form before we differentiate is, is useful because in this form, I can write um, a, an effective field theory describing these determinants. H is the, is the Hamiltonian of my quantum system of interest. So for example, JT gravity or its dual boundary description. 
And what all of these field theories have in common, and this is the, this is the key point, is that they actually have a particular symmetry, which essentially is, a, is, the, is the mathematical form, form, formalization of the fact that the Hamiltonian in each of these insertions is the same, because I'm interested in only one quantum system. So this actually um, becomes a rotational symmetry, and it's a unitary rotational symmetry, and because there are, um, in some sense, fermionic and bosonic determinants, it is a graded symmetry. So in this case, it's a U2 slash 2 symmetry. But it is always broken um, in, by quantum chaotic dynamics in this pattern. U2 slash 2 goes to two factors of U1 slash 1. And whenever you have the symmetry breaking scheme, you can write down an effective field theory that only takes into account the goldstones of this broken symmetry. And um, what we showed is that the goldstones of this effective uh, of this broken symmetry precisely reproduces the level correlations of random matrix theory. So for example, I can calculate just to, to hark back to this, I can calculate this curve simply from the goldstone modes of the symmetry breaking. And the fact that it's universal is the fact that it's related to the symmetry. So this purple curve, the universal purple curve here and there, basically is a consequence of the symmetry breaking principle here. So there will be a nonlinear sigma model which lives on the coset, which is just the unbroken group over the broken group as usual. This is you know, usual um, effective field theory um, arguments. Now, um, very good. So now let me summarize this and this will be the end of my, um, in some sense, review part. So thermalization of uh, closed quantum systems we should think of this in a statistical physics way. And we should think of it as being, um, in some sense, universally characterized by the idea of quantum chaos. So a, a, quant a closed quantum system can thermalize and it can have these level spacing uh, 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 statistics that look as if you sampled its Hamiltonian from a um, random matrix distribution, but it's really just a consequence of symmetry breaking. So I'm, I'm reformulating this idea of the matrix universality in terms of symmetry breaking universality. And I can use the symmetry breaking universality to identify, for example, this RAM contribution. And the slogan that I give for this is usually one for all, all for one, in the sense of, this is of course a quote of uh, the three musketeers, but it's the point that one quantum system because of the symmetry breaking principle looks like its Hamiltonian has been sampled from an ensemble of quantum systems. And in the same sense, if you look at the behavior of an ensemble of quantum systems, you find signatures which also are mirrored in the physics of individual quantum chaotic systems. And we should take this very seriously and we should, we should apply this to ADS-CFT, which will be the remainder of my talk. But I want to, I want to also mention, because this will, be, um, this will be an idea that I will come to right at the end, that what I talked about right now was the random matrix way of, uh, of, of understanding these quantities. There is also a different school or seemingly different school, which is this eigenstate thermalization. And eigenstate thermalization actually says conceptually very similar things, but in a mathematically very differently encapsulated form. So what Deutsch and Frednicki and um, I, I believe other researchers also came up with as um, an idea of understanding the thermalization again of an individual quantum system is that even an individual quantum system, I can understand um, its spectrum statistically and the way that they, um, that they um, refer to it is that they say, let's take an operator O whose two point function I might want to study. This two-point function, by the way, will again have some sort of rampant plateau behavior like I showed before. Um, then if I look at its uh, eigen, if I look at its matrix elements with respect to eigenstates of the Hamiltonian M and N, then they actually look as follows. I have a smooth function of the energy, which is it's, uh, the microcanonical average of O at the energy that's the average of these two eigenstates on the diagonal. But then off the diagonal, I have something which is suppressed in entropy with a second smooth function, but RMN is in fact itself a random matrix that um, in the original proposal 
is sampled from a Gaussian distribution, just like the GOE Wigner matrix or GUE Wigner matrix. So I can understand the matrix elements of operators also in a statistical way. And that's in some sense what ETH says and has been very successful in explaining um, the, the thermalization dynamics of many body systems. And at the end, I will come back to this ETH way of thinking about it. But what I want to say is that ETH also has this notion of one quantum chaotic system follows a statistical distribution that, um, that makes a connection to random matrix ensembles here. Okay, so um, ma random matrix universality, as I'm saying here, arises in a very wide array of contexts. Um, so it can be some explicit averaging. As I said, this is the ensemble looks like one system. It can be coarse graining because, for example, you're only interested in some, um, you know, sub system and you're integrating over other degrees of freedom. It can also be ignorance. For example, it can be that the system is so complicated that we have no, no way of studying the exact, the exact energy eigenstates, but we can still make um, very precise statements about their statistics thanks to quantum chaos. Or we could just not want to bother in the sense that, you know, for the purposes of what we want to describe, we only need to know such statistical notions as ETH or random matrix theories. Okay, so this periodic orbit theory, let's forget about this comment. This has something to do with semi-classics, which maybe I will end, uh, well, get back to in the end, but it's not important now. So um, let's see. So um, yeah, I, th I, will, I think I will skip this and I will just get, go to this curve here. So um, using this, this idea of symmetry breaking um, is actually a um, nice way of understanding the different phases of the special form factor um, in a general sort of fashion. So the ramp I showed you, this I, I claimed that this comes from the two boundary wormhole. Another way of substantiating this is that I can think about this, this Goldstone theory and the Goldstone theory has a target space manifold, which I said was just the quotient of the um, unbroken over the broken group. But geometrically, it turns out to be a two sphere times hyperbolic two space. And if I look at the perturbation theory around the, the saddle point that breaks this symmetry, I find that the Goldstone bosons indeed geometrically have this description of, of cylinders that connect two circles, so we call them wormholes, uh, and including its, its higher topological generation, uh, um, generalizations. And if I add up the perturbation theory around the saddle, I find precisely a linear rise. So the linear ramp is in some sense the perturbative expansion where the excitations are my two boundary wormholes around one of the saddle. Um, however, when the fluctuations become bigger, I realized that I should also include a second symmetry breaking saddle point, which is this so-called Andreev Alchula saddle point. And if I add perturbation theory of this saddle and perturbation theory of this saddle, I find that this linear ramp uh, stops and gives rise to a plateau. And if I wait even longer, then I find that the fluctuations become so large that I now need to integrate over the entire manifold. So this is this picture here this entire sigma model manifold. And this is what eventually um, resolves the individual uh, energy eigenlevels. And the interesting thing is what, what does this look like in gravity? So that's um, what I want to describe now. What is the essentially the coherent bulk picture of this phase in gravity? So this is um, recent work that I um, published with the Amsterdam group, and in particular, Eric Belinda and his two students, and Boris Post, Jeremy van der Hayden, and uh, Alexander Altland in Cologne. So what we need is we need um, what uh, has been called since, since the days of the early matrix models, the universe field theory, and in particular for JT gravity. So I, I need a gadget that allows me to generate correlations between um, n energy eigenvalues. And the way that this, so you see, um, why, why do we call this a universe field theory? 
because in this two-dimensional gravity world, if I take a spatial slice, then I get um, one of these circles. And so if I take a space-time that links many of these boundary circles, which are associated to either different inverse temperatures or different energies, then I have correlations between many of these universes. And so the theory that generates all of these correlations with arbitrary genus is what has been called the universe field theory for JT gravity. So I want in some sense um, a correlation function with respect to sources. And if I differentiate it with respect to sources, each of these sources will fix one of these energies and it will create all the space times that are infilling um, for these boundary conditions. And note that this chaos effective field theory that Alex Altland and I wrote down is such a universe field theory. But um, what I'm looking for here is an intrinsically gravitational description, not, a, um, not a, an effective field theory description that also applies to um, boundary quantum systems. Now, what can actually be done is that you can, you can realize JT gravity because it's a two-dimensional theory of gravity, technically speaking, as a world sheet theory of a string because a string world sheet is also two-dimensional. But that's very nice because in string theory, we in some sense know how to describe such universe field theories because we can just um, look at the string field theory. The string field theory is the theory that allows us to um, understand scattering between arbitrary in and out states that contain arbitrary numbers of strings. And in this case, that will be arbitrary number of universes. And then we can also in this context understand this fixed energy boundary condition. It's just a D brain. It just like in usual physics, a string theory, this is a D brain. And so we use this inside um, and we basically translated the language um, of the chaos effective field theory into string field theory language. In particular, these determinant operators that I showed you become vertex, vertex operators. The inverse determinant operators become the conjugate vertex operators. And in order to get these um, determinant correlation correlators, you see, um, let me go back one more time to show you, we now want to calculate these kind of ratios of determinants, and they become then correlation functions of these vertex operators here. And it turns out that we can calculate these determinant of the, the these, these products of vertex operators. Um, so why am I saying KS here? This stands for Kodaira Spencer, and Kodaira Spencer is just the string field theory that applies to the JT context. So this is a string field theory, um, a particular string field theory, um, and we proved, so this here, I'm not giving you the details because there's a lot of machinery, but we proved this statement here, which is the most important statement for this part of the talk, namely that um, the vertex operator correlation functions, which stand in for these determinants can be written in terms of an integral over an N slash N graded matrix A, where I have um, a particular potential that we call gamma of A, and X is just the, the source of, X is just the matrix, the diagonal elements of which are the little X's that I'm showing here. Okay, so this is just a source if you want. But gamma of A is a specific explicitly known potential. But that's actually not important, the fact that we can write, write down this potential. The only thing that's important is that we, we know that this potential also breaks this symmetry, because this n slash n is just, again, our causal symmetry that I showed before. And if I do a semi-classical analysis of this gamma of A, it breaks the symmetry in precisely the pattern that I showed before. So I've now, from gravity, I have, I have constructed for you the symmetry breaking scenario. So um, these universe correlations show causal symmetry breaking semi-classically, I'm saying semi-classically because you need to do a subtle point analysis of this, of this integral. But look at what is the semi-classical parameter. It's e to the entropy. And so that's why you get this doubly non-perturbative physics, right? It's, it's non-perturbative in e to the entropy, therefore doubly non-perturbative. All right, and so this gives a gravity explanation of the plateau. Um, 
it's quite interesting because um, it revives an old subject um, the correspondence between the world sheet string theory and the matrix model description so this this here is if you want a matrix model description right and this is a direct correspondence between the string field theory and the matrix model it revives these older ideas of um, of the Aganagic, Wafa, Dijkraft, Clem, and Marcos Marinho, um, who looked at this from, if you want, a completely different perspective. They were interested in describing the topological string. And we found exactly the same mathematical structure, but starting from quantum chaos. So here, quantum chaos expressed in gravitational language is actually open closed string duality, um, which has been studied by these people before. And to me, that's, um, that's a very fascinating um, hint at a very deep connection between um, quantum chaos and two-dimensional gravity. So there is behind these old matrix models that people were studying for quantum gravity, there seems to be a deep connection to quantum gravity that is um, so far unknown and that I think deserves further study. So, um, this is precisely the starting point for what I wanted to talk to you about for the unpublished work. So before I do that, let me um, try and summarize. So the, the idea was that the quantum chaos um, it is interesting because it is like a, a very powerful microscope for the spectrum of the theory. So um, by looking at these universal quantum chaotic contributions to spectral distributions, I'm able to resolve the spectrum of a, of a gravitational system at the level of individual energies. And once I'm able to do that, um, I'm, I'm able to recover <clears throat> basically the predictions of unitarity out of the gravitational answers. So the late time unitarization, and in particular, the rise and the plateau, um, are just encoded in saddles of this chaos effective field theory. Um, I have shown you that this chaos effective field theory is related to um, expansion in wormholes, in two boundary wormholes, or if you want more spectral correlations, they will be multi-boundary wormholes. And um, I've shown you a gravitational way of describing it, although this gravitational way, I will admit, it is still somewhat abstract you know you still have to go to this idea of string field theory and Kodaira Spencer theory it would probably be interesting to try and also um, express this more universally where you don't have to go to these yeah you know, let's say very um, you know very specific string field theory notions but it is if you want conceptually it is a very um, a very uh, explicit realization of old ideas of Coleman, Giddings, and Strominger um, about wormholes um, and, and black hole physics. Of course, recently, Marolf and Maxfield talked about this. And there is an alternative picture on this by Clifford Johnson, who studies this non-perturbative physics, but only from the matrix model point of view um, and not from the gravity point of view. All right, so, <clears throat> so a few outstanding questions here would be, um, um, should we think of bulk gravity as generating the moments of the statistical distribution of energy eigenlevels? Is this the role of gravity? That's, um, I think, an open question. Um, and then here, um, the, those both of these questions basically ask, what about higher dimensions? And I think that's, of course, extremely important, but um, um, we have to go in baby steps. And so one way of doing going to higher dimensions um, is actually um, by adding matter fields to JT, because you know you can think of the matter field as sort of mocking up uh, the dimensional reduction you will get from ADS3. So let me tell you some thoughts about adding matter fields to JT. But for this, I will need my iPad, so I'm going to try and, and uh, join that as well, if I may. Uh, why am I I'm not getting out of this? Okay. Sorry. 
So I need to join the Zoom meeting one more time. Um, I'm going to put the ID in, so that was H six zero. Putting in the password. So, could someone please make my iPad? Um, also into, um, I can share also the screen, please. Very good, thank you. I'm going to share content. Okay, so you should see my screen now. Yeah. So what I want to talk about now is I want to talk about, um, it, let me call it the ETH matrix model. And the idea is that we're going to make a, make a connection between matrix model and ETH. And the idea is this will describe the theory of JT gravity plus a matter field. And why JT plus matter? Because we, we can think of the matter theory, we can think of the matter theory, this is sort of like um, maybe a baby step to higher dimensions. Because you see, if you were, um, to describe in a two-dimensional way ADS3, then you would have all these kaluza klein matter fields. And so we're adding one of them and we'll see what that does to the matrix model. And it does something extremely interesting. But I do want, of course, to say um, that this is work in collaboration with um, a wonderful set of collaborators. And in particular, it's with Daniel Jeffress. Um, so with Jeffress and with um, David Kolchmeyer, who's a graduate student. Um, and Bawazan Muhammadzanov, who is a postdoc, who have both done extremely um, impressive and titanic work on this. And this is paper is a paper or two papers that should come out this month, in fact. So um, what we have learned is basically that um, quantum chaos, so I have told you basically that chaos um, and topology, so to, by topology, I mean things like um, these expansion in the Goldstone modes, which are classified also by topology. These are a way of understanding wormholes in the Euclidean path integral. So they're saying that the reason that we find um, wormholes in the Euclidean gravitational path integral is precisely um, quantum chaos. And the example of this that I mentioned is precisely the duality between JT gravity, which is this theory of gravity in two dimensions with a dilaton field here, okay? And um, a matrix model, which people like to call the SSS matrix model after Saad Schenk and Stanford. So this has some particular, this has some particular potential, let's call it the SSS potential. So we have JT here, and on the other side, we have a double scaled matrix model with a particular potential V of H, but it has one matrix, only one matrix. And I showed you how in some sense um, to take this fully to the non-perturbative realm and to understand this from a gravitational uh, picture. That's what I to told you about um, um, so far. But what I want to sketch right now is that what we can do is we can generalize this. And in particular, we take 
the action, uh, the JT action that I wrote above, plus I add something extremely simple. I just add a matter field. So something like d phi squared plus m squared phi squared d2x and note this field that I add is not the dilaton, right? So this is why I pointed it out here. There's this dilaton, which is part of the description of JT. Here I'm adding an, addition, oops, an additional matter field. I'm adding an additional matter field with its own kinetic term. And in fact, gravitationally, phi is dual to some operator, which has a scaling dimension delta, which is, which is determined by the mass m. And what I want to say is, um, how do we do this? So, um, you know, um, what is the key ingredient is precisely the key idea is ETH. So if you take this operator O between two eigenstates, then um, it has a diagonal piece, which we don't need to talk about right now. But it has this entropically uh, uh, suppressed contribution, which is supposed to be a random matrix, right? So Rij is a random matrix in the sense that it has a mean, which actually vanishes, and that it has a variance, which is set to one. Um, so if you want, of course, uh, in practice, the thing that controls the variance is this smooth order one function f. But so you can choose that the thing that remains the R, you can choose it to have variance one. But it is just a random matrix. It's if you want, it's just another random matrix. Um, so so our idea, and I will I will describe it very intuitively. Our idea is actually. So the idea is, um, in some sense, the obvious one. Okay, we we have, J T. So we have, uh, G phi, R plus two. This gives us one random matrix, which is if you want the H random matrix. And then we have um, the other contribution to the theory, which is G um, D phi squared plus M squared phi squared. And this is a second random matrix, the R random matrix. So we should formulate instead of a one matrix model, which we had previously, we should simply formulate this as a two matrix model. So the dual of JT plus matter will be some integral where I have to define a measure for the random matrix H and the random matrix O. So E to the minus trace of a potential of O and H. And if you want this two, this two matrix model will actually be, this will be a random matrix theory description Well, it will, it will contain a random matrix description of ETH. Okay. So instead of going into um, all of the details also um, in view of time, what I want to just say is that um, there is really two interesting aspects of this and we hope we'll be describing both of them well in the paper. Um, one is that this is, this is actually interesting in statistical physics. This gives a new perspective on ETH. And in particular, it will, it will um, for, first of all, you can rewrite it as a two matrix model. This is not something that people have been doing previously, but also it will uh, in particular show that it's very natural that Rij is not in fact Gaussian. So there are non-Gaussianities of the form, um, well, that, that you have, you know, like um, 
r i1 i2 up to r i n minus 1 i n, which will be of the form e to the minus n minus 1 times the entropy times some smooth function. Let me call it g n, which will depend on all the energies. So it will, will depend on n energies. And that will also um, make up for the indices here. And it's interesting because this is very natural. This comes out automatically from this matrix model description, but it has been something that has also been explored by the statistical physics community recently, and in particular by Fuini and Korchan. So this resonates very well with current research in statistical physics. And secondly, and I will stop on this second remark because I also realized that I am between you and the banquet. So let me just give you the second upshot. Um, so it gives it gives a viable gives a viable um, random matrix description of this theory of JT plus matter, which is very similar to the SSS model of just JT, and the upshot is that you fix we fix the potential V of O and H by uh, matching the disk correlators of a JT plus matter. And we get as an output the entire topological expansion. So I will finish by saying that we believe that this is a um, two matrix model version of the topological recursion, which was so successful for just JT. And um, well, we hope that this um, two matrix model way of describing um, JT plus matter together with its conceptual relation to ETH will help us, as I said, propulse a lot of these ideas potentially into higher dimensions. But um, let me thank you. I apologize once more for the connection problems, and I'm happy to take your questions. Uh, thank you very much, for Julian. So are there questions or comments? Thank you for uh, your very interesting talk. And um, in the, at the very first introduction, you gave us three time scales. And what is uh, uh, most relevant to the usual, I mean, the thermalization time? Ah, well, that, that's a very good question. In fact, I should have given four time scales because. Um, so, so there, even earlier, if you want, there is this thing that uh, I think people call the local thermalization time. Yes, I mean, you know, it always depends on perspective. I was putting the uh, scrambling time, let's say somewhere here, which is like log S, and I was sort of selling it as early time physics because we actually, you know, as you, as you know, of course, we looked at Heisenberg time, which is much later, but even earlier than the scrambling time here, there is often, the local thermalization time scale. So let's say this is local thermalization. Um, and this time scale is typically given by um, beta or one, one over beta. Yeah, one over beta. So this is this is dominated by actually the, the temperature itself. And that's a that's um, compared to the kind of physics that I was talking about, this is extremely early time scale. But of course, so thank you for the question, but it is true that many people say, okay, local thermalization doesn't yet mean that, for example, information has spread globally through the system. So therefore we really should think of the scrambling time as being the thermalization time scale. And then other people come along and they say, well, but at the scrambling time, the system hasn't yet gone ergodic. So we should think, at the, we should think of, okay, actually at the tallest time here as the thermalization time scale. So you know it depends a little bit on what you what what is your what is your um, uh, favorite definition of thermalization, but it is absolutely true that there is an earlier time scale. So thank you for making that uh, point. Thank you. 
or are there other questions? Um, uh, GT gravity with a meta case. Uh, actually, one can uh, introduce the potential, the dilaton. Uh, usually, mm -hmm. if, if you introduce a uh, uh, um, real high potential, then some something field theory calculation can be uh, performed perform exactly in some yes. in some limit. So mm -hmm. you introduce new or meta field to the case to is it possible to consider similar calculation well i think you're referring to um so indeed there has been work by um i think Teriachi and maxfield and there's also been work by witten which indeed looked at how can you generalize the sss model for a general dilaton potential and they also linked it to sort of a gas of defects in the bulk so that's if you want something like adding matter, but it's not matter in the sense that it has this nice kinetic term and so on. So this, this is what we do differently. And so in that sense, their calculations are not so relevant for what, what we do. But of course, if I had, you know, had more time, I would have mentioned also um, their work because that's certainly an important predecessor. I think this is what you're referring to, right? So you add some interesting potential for the dilaton. You, do, you have U of phi as well, in addition to the JT action, and that can be incorporated in the matrix model, et cetera. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this uh, chaos bond, do, do, do you have any bulk picture uh, in the string field theory picture that you propose for JT gravity chaos? Do you have any? A picture of that. Uh, that's another good question. So, I mean, the answer is I don't, but um, I think it'd be interesting to ask that question. But it's a little bit more subtle, the question. Um, you're probably aware of it, but again, the chaos bound the, is something that talks about scrambling chaos. And it's not obvious how the scrambling chaos is actually imprinted on these time scales. Um, I, I sort of believe that there should be some imprint, but I don't. I don't understand it at least currently how how that would work. Um, but I think it's quite interesting. Yeah. But you see the the scrambling bound um, in the form of um, the um, in, in the classic form that Shankar, Stanford, and Maldasena proposed it. That has to do with different kinds of physics. That has to do with the physics of shock waves. And so the the scrambling bound in the let's say the, the usual way that they would have thought about um, is not really related to the time scales that I talked about, but I think it would be very interesting to, to try and relate them. And I actually, my intuition would be that there is some relation. Uh, I have a question. So here mm -hmm. you consider the one like a metal field, but uh, from the point of view of, of SYK model, uh, it, it seems that there are many like a meta field or yeah. the, yes. so in the yes, end, absolutely. do you have to include the, this many, infinite many like a meta field or? Yes, I think so. So, I mean, um, my goal is not to match exactly currently to SYK, but the, the question that you ask in general um, is very relevant. And yes, so at the level of the description that we have for every meta field, you would want to introduce another random matrix. And what that would give you would be, um, well, this is a mathematical structure that people call a theory of free probability. So there are probability distributions of many random matrices, um, and they have been studied um, as, as sort of a non-commutative non generalization of usual random random variables. And so this is what the structure would be, would be some kind of free probability theory. But the general point that you're making is absolutely correct, that we only add one matter field and that becomes a two matrix model. And if you add another matter field, we become a three matrix model and so, so on and so forth. Um, I see. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, I have a question about the quantum chaos in the large n limit or infinite n. Yeah. So 
So is there a different property of quantum chaos between finite end systems and infinite end systems? The question is whether there is a difference between them. Uh, yeah, between finite end and infinite yes, end. Absolutely. And in fact, for almost everything that I was saying, it is crucially important that we're at finite end. So, um, so for example, um, you know, the, the, even the, the plateau in the end. So, you know, I had this rampant plateau. The height of this plateau is e to the minus entropy. And if I go to infinite n, then uh, the height of this plateau uh, would, of course, just go to zero. Oops. This would just go to zero. So there would be no, that, so, so in some sense, there would be no ergodic physics to describe. So you want to have a locally finite Hilbert space for this ergodic physics. So this is, all of this here is if you want the quantum ergodic phase. And for this, it is important that you are at finite n. So we need finite n. Okay. Thank you. So are there other questions or comments? No question? Okay. Then, so let's start the speaker again. Well, thank you so much, and uh, I hope you have a good banquet, and I hope I didn't take too much of your time. Sorry again for the connection problems. Thank you very much for your good talk. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.